Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Tracy Cook, and I'm the online media manager for ModernAnalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled, Our Requirements Are Good, So Why Aren't We Delivering Value? Today's featured speaker is Joy Batty, Vice President, C-Level. Today's webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the question and answer session at the end. Please be sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the GoToWebinar software. Thank you. Joy, welcome. Thanks, Tracy. Um, welcome to all of you, and thanks for joining us here uh, this afternoon, this morning, depending on what part of the world you're in, maybe even this evening. I'm excited to be here. Uh, always enjoy a good webinar with the Modern Analyst team. Um, let me just jump right into kind of what I'm going to do today. I have a lot to cover. Um, but definitely, like Tracy said, please load up questions. If I can catch them in the fly, I will, but if not, we'll circle back and try and get them at the end, and at the end, you will also have my contact info if you want to reach out um, offline, so I welcome all those things. So today, the first thing I want to do is really talk about what it even means to measure BA success. Um, then we're going to go into how do you quantify business value on projects, We'll talk about what kind of metrics matter, like what should we be measuring so that we can maybe capture executive attention, um, and how does that relate to what we do in the business analysis field. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking through some results where we surveyed our own projects and our own customers, um, because I think there's some interesting nuggets in that that will probably reflect some of what you see or not. We'll find out. Um, and then I'll leave you with a couple tips of things that I think you can do right away on your projects. So. Just going to dive right in here. So why are we here? Well, a few years ago, um, there was some research done. Actually, PMI did some research specifically that showed that all of the projects that fail, um, and you can put that number in somewhere in the 30 to 50 percent, that of all those projects that are failing, 47 percent of them are failing due to poor requirements management. Okay. That leads me to wonder, how do we turn that number around? How do we know if we're doing a good job at our requirements, right? There's a whole different problem here, by the way, which is that 30 to 50% of projects are still failing. Uh, and, and I think that will tie in to kind of what we're talking about today. So inevitably, when I talk to customers, um, particularly those who are trying to improve their requirements processes, they ask questions like, how do I know if my requirements are any good? How do I know if my requirements team is doing a good job? How can we show we're adding value, right? People are always asking us, like, what kind of metrics can they use to measure the quality of the requirements or their business analysis work, right? So we get that a lot from our customers. Um, in fact, in our own organization here at Sea level I'm always thinking about how do we measure the quality of what we're doing, right? Like, I want to make sure we're doing a good job. What does that look like? So I think this question of measuring has become even more prevalent over the last like five years than say even 15 to 20 years ago. And I think these questions are important. Um, often I think that as requirements practitioners or business analysts or product managers, um, those roles, I think we feel undervalued, maybe subordinate to other roles in some companies. Um, sometimes we are treated like note takers, right? Glorified secretaries. Um, it's not always a glamorous job and we don't get treated in a positive way sometimes. And it's not every organization, but I definitely see that in a lot of the customers that I work with. Um, and so it's a bit discouraging. And so I think that understanding the impact of what we're doing in this job is really important. It can help us feel good about what we're doing. Uh, and demonstrate that value. And also there are studies out there right now that are showing the enterprise architect and the business analysis skills demand is dropping. Um, that's all the more reason we need to demonstrate the value we're adding. And I'm hoping because you're here today that you believe in the value of this requirements work. Um, and so what I would like to hope is that you can take some nuggets out of this back into your own, your own organizations to demonstrate that value to other people in your team. So I want to start off with a question. I'm going to pose this to everybody in the audience. Um, and like Tracy said, you know, if you have questions, put them in the question box. So right now, I actually need you to use the question box for a different purpose, which is to answer this question. And then we'll clear out those because they're not technically questions. But this is a way you can communicate back with me. So I want to know, how do you measure the quality of the BA work that you do today in your organization, right? How do you know if a business analyst 
product manager, whatever you want to call it, how do you know they're doing a good job? And how do you know if the requirements are any good? So just jot some ideas down in the question box and I'll just read them back to you all. <clears throat> we'll go from there. So I'll just give you a couple minutes to let some of those answers come in and then I'll read them as we go. All right, so we've got defect density. That's great, right? I love that answer because it's talking about when somebody takes the requirements and goes to build the system or the software, right? How many defects are we seeing in it? If we have less defects, that's an indication we're doing a good job. Peer review, perfect. We do some peer reviews of each other's work. We do that uh, in our organization as well. Um, taking client feedback, right? The right thing has to be built. That's a fantastic answer. That actually aligns very tightly with what I'm going to talk about today. Um, Developers know what to develop, right? Did I involve the right stakeholders, change management? We can look at maybe some of the outcomes in the change management process. Comments from subject matter experts. These are great answers, you guys, okay. Um, stakeholder feedback, error proof. Interesting, okay, doesn't need much grooming during the grooming session, that's a good one, particularly as we move to agile approaches. How much are we having to elaborate uh, beyond what we've already done? Uh, client feedback using acceptance, testing of build meets the requirements. Okay, these are good answers, y'all. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to keep going on here then um, and share with you some other ideas. All right, so here's some ideas that we have seen in organizations around how you can measure requirements quality, right? We can check for these things. Some of these might look familiar to you, right? Are they well written? Are the requirements complete? Are they atomic? Testable? No ambiguous words? Coherent? Are they verified? Did they pass some kind of a quality checker? I know there's some people out there trying to build systems that do this for us. <laughs> um, do we have a clear glossary? Do we have unique identifiers in every requirement? Are they consistent? Right? So these are all things we could do. And you guys may add to this list if you're thinking through it. And that's great. But here's the bad news. <laughs> I think that this stuff is the most uninteresting problem ever that we could solve about requirements work. Um, we used to do this on projects in, in our company, so I'm going to own up to this. We used to um, do these really in-depth project requirement assessments uh, as peer reviews in our teams. And it was complicated. We would have, for every project, we would have three peers who were not on the project review each other's project you know, artifacts, requirements work. We had about 100 different criteria that we evaluated against, things like you're seeing on the screen up there behind now, the sleeping guy. <laughs> um, we had fancy score system, and it told me kind of the relative performance from team to team of how good the requirements were that we wrote. Now, I did get something useful out of doing this, is that helped me zero in on where are the biggest problems in our organization in terms of the quality of the work that we were producing. So it wasn't of zero value, I want to be really clear about that. But I'm also going to tell you that the teams hated doing it. Um, they wanted to, to go out and do that analytical thinking, to do the elicitation sessions, to do the modeling, right? That's the stuff that's fun in their job. They didn't want to check whether their peers had unique identifiers on requirements. Like, it just wasn't fun for anybody, the people being reviewed or the people doing the reviews. So we don't do those anymore is what I'm going to tell you. And I want to go back to this quote from a few slides ago, right? I had said that poor requirements are a major source of project failure. And that's really the wrong part to emphasize here, right? So think about it. What should we be focused on? The important thing here is actually the fact that so many projects are failing. That to me is the most interesting thing we can look at in the job of analysis or product managers or product owners, right, in the agile space is really how, when, we, when we're asking about how do we measure the quality of our requirements, what we need to ask is a different question. We should be asking, are we delivering business value? Do we have the right requirements so that we can meet the business objectives? That's the measurement that tells us if our requirements are any good. Because at the end of the day, Requirements are only a means to an end. Even if the requirements that appear to be high quality, right? If you go back to that checklist I had, the requirements seem like they're really high quality written statements. They aren't going to do you any good if they aren't aligned with achieving the right business objectives. So I can write the perfect requirements, to, you know, document or deliverables and still deliver absolutely terrible results to my business. And the truth is, if we could deliver successful projects every time without doing any requirements work, we would, right? We don't spend 
money on the requirements for fun. We do it because it helps us deliver successful projects. So as the people who are responsible for the requirements work, we need to do a really good job on the requirements so that we can deliver that desired end, that business objective or the business value that we're trying to get out of a project. And I know that that is sometimes hard for people in this profession to hear because we're just a means to an end. But we're a really important means to an end if we can shift our thinking to be less about the quality of those requirements and more about, am I actually doing requirements for the right product at the end of the day? Um, and I want to stop here real quick and mention this because I'm quite sure we have a bunch of people in the audience who are agile focused. Um, what I will say is that I'm talking about requirements that still applies very much in the agile space. So I don't want to lose sight of that. We may call it something different, right? It could be user stories and acceptance criteria elaborating those things. So for the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to call it requirements, but know that that is everything I'm saying is absolutely true in that space as well. I heard a story once about a guy who was working on a project to do requirements for an aircraft carrier, um, which I recognize that is not what you're looking at on the screen. But anyway, good fun on the on the rowing picture here. Anyway, they were doing requirements for an aircraft carrier, and they were getting really detailed in their requirements around what that boat was and how what it had to do. Um, and he kind of paused in the middle of the project. He said he stopped and he realized that at the end of the day, there are only a few things the boat truly has to do to be an aircraft carrier, right? It has to float, it has to move in the water, like propel forward in some way, it has to handle airplanes landing, and it has to be steerable, like we need to be able to change direction, right, and so on, things like that. Um, and he was in the weeds, and like these nitty gritty detailed requirements discussions where people are arguing over um, very like, just detailed things that are they are almost just not important when he realized really true success is going to be measured if it could do those things that we just talked about like does it float does it take aircraft landing on it right so at the end of the day right does the boat float that is the question he needed to stay focused on and when the conversations deviated from that that was a really good indication his requirements weren't going to um, serve their purpose at the end of the day having the right color of blue on the walls doesn't matter if your boat doesn't float <laughs> I'm not even sure, I don't know how relevant this is, but this is kind of interesting. Um, if you search in Google for these two different phrases, right, measuring requirements quality and measuring business value, um, what you will notice, and obviously those numbers will be different every day that you would look, but what you will see is that there are far fewer results for measuring business value as there are compared to requirements quality. Um, so I think that's interesting. People are writing about and talking about how do we measure requirements quality, not how do we measure business value or business objectives? Those, those, um, and again, I'm looking at what the results are when you search on the internet, which is an indicative of the words that are used out there in, in this space. Um, if nothing else, I think this at least hints at the fact that we as a community, both academics and practitioners, are talking and writing about the wrong thing. Um, so I think, I don't know, I think there's something interesting to think about there. One of those questions, like I read a lot of, academic papers from universities in the requirements space. I love that there are universities that have a focus on requirements now. However, their focus tends to be around more the things like, how do I measure if, um, you know, I have good written statements or how do I find ambiguous requirements in a set of requirements? And it feels like those are probably easier for them to measure and that's why they measure them. So I find that kind of frustrating personally. All right, let's move on. I've talked a little bit about business value, um, and, and I want to get into how do we quantify, quantify the business value so we can measure if we're delivering it or not. Um, so first, I want to set the stage for how we deliver, you know, define business value. Um, these next few slides are just going to be concepts relevant to some of the metrics, and I'll get into those metrics next. I just feel like we need to kind of baseline on what we're talking about here around business objectives or business value. So I think value can be measured through something called business objectives. Um, a business objective is the benefit that an organization expects to receive from a project, and they should really be written in a quantitative and measurable way. Um, you may call these goals in your organization, and that is fine. The key is that they should be something that you can quantify and measure, um, and that and measure part can be really hard. Uh, business objectives can almost always be related back to money, so you'll see that up here, right? In the business context, that usually means something like increasing revenue, um, increasing profit, 
could be decreasing cost to the company. Uh, sometimes we have to use proxies for money. It could be the number of new customers on our site or number of units sold. Uh, but ultimately, those things really relate back to money, right? I want more customers because more customers gives me more revenue. Um, many, many projects, I would say most projects we work with, end up wanting to have that proxy for money because the level that we are working at is just so far removed from that bottom line um, that that gets really hard. Um, I do have an example up here. Um, this is from one of the books, and I'll reference the book later, but it's one of the books that I worked on, where this is from a chemical purchasing system that they were putting in a chemistry lab. And an objective for that project was something like, I want to reduce chemical purchasing expenses from $1 million to $750,000 in the first year. Super simple, straight and easy. My ultimate goal here is to reduce my purchasing expenses by $250,000 over one year. Okay. You know, I worked on a project uh, many years ago now, but that project, there were two different versions of software for two very different types of customers, and um, they'd grown into their own um, major systems or applications, and, but there was quite a bit of overlap in the functionality. And the project that I was working on, the goal, the stated goal, was to combine these two systems into one. Um, it was interesting. We basically had to use one as a baseline and then find the gaps in the other one and add those to the first one, right? Kind of simple. But here's the thing. Combining two systems into one is not a business objective. It was a solution to a problem, but the business was never really going to care if it was two systems or one. That was something that the technology team cared about, not the business. There was no obvious dollar benefit associated as, as I stated it. And you could argue there may be a case to reduce expenses or costs by combining two systems into one. Maybe in your world it is. In this particular case, that even could have been true, but that's not how people were talking about the project. Their objective was combine two systems into one. And the minute you can't frame that in the dollar sense, you definitely are going to lose um, your business stakeholders, particularly at the executive level. Their buy-in is going to drop pretty rapidly, right, because they're not going to understand the benefit of it. One thing that's important to remember about defining business objectives or business value is that you, you do it early on in the strategy lifecycle, um, then you go and you perform the work on this project to deliver the project, and you don't necessarily realize that business value until the project's done and sometimes long times after it's done. And this is important to remember because it makes it really, really hard to know if our project delivered the business value, and, and you may not know for a really long time. So when I talk about how do we measure the success of our work? And I tell you it's about, did you deliver business value or not? This is the hardest thing about this job is sometimes I don't know for another year whether I actually delivered the business value. I think with that in mind, you should be thinking about are there interim things I can measure that tell me I'm on track to deliver the overall business value? I would like to, again, let's go back to our question box for a minute here. Um, I really want to have you spend a couple minutes um, thinking about how do you use business objectives today in your organization, or if you don't, how could you use them? I'd be very curious, maybe even just in your answer, mention we use them or we don't use them, and here's some thoughts around it. And again, I'll share with you some of what I see come in through the question box. So go ahead and take a minute to add some remarks there. While you're doing that, I will see Pamela has said, we definitely need to shift our focus to the business end. I love to hear that. Problem is that IT focuses on the doing, not on the business value. And Pamela, you are not alone at all out there. Um, many, I would say probably more often than not, the technology team is worried about technology measures and what they can measure it about isn't about delivering business value. So for us helping do requirements work, unfortunately, we also get measured that way. Um, okay, we use them to work out what the features are to add to the games that we create. That is awesome. I love to hear that. I'm guessing that project relates to game development. Pretty cool in itself. Um, sorry, my screen is scrolling while I'm trying to read because you guys are doing a great job typing in. All right. Um, here's some more. Good answers coming in. Okay, so we try to incorporate business value into any of our IT projects. I love that from Simone. Uh, <laughs> okay, Alan, this is funny. He says, how would you not use business objectives? I think that's along the lines of how could companies not be doing this? Uh, and I'm gonna tell you what I normally see happen is that people write them at the beginning 
and then they put them on a shelf and they never look at them again. And, and uh, that's what's frustrating to me is that we need to have them top of mind throughout our entire effort is what are we driving at? What does success look like? And most companies actually just don't do that. I worked with one company where um, they got this so wholeheartedly. They were, they were trying to replace a legacy system with a new system. And they had some very specific objectives that they had to meet. They had to like maintain performance um, as they moved from the old system to the new system. And it was such a big deal that they printed on giant sheets of paper um, what their objectives were and they hung them on the wall where the IT team lived. And so every day, whether you got up to use the kitchen or the restroom or come in for the day or leave for the day, you walked right by these objectives literally every day. They wanted them to be in their face. And I thought it was so cool. It was the technology team, um, the IT team that needed to be seeing them. And I love that they recognize that. I just don't see that in most of the places we work. Um, here's some other comments real quick, right? Uh, BAs are here to deliver on the business objective, so that's fantastic. That, it seems like there's some really good examples, and that makes me hopeful that so many of you are using them. Um, here's one. Yes, we do use them on a project now to deploy a SaaS for application portfolio management. All right, you do use them for future disposition. Yep, so the future disposition or rationalization, they're using them for that. Um, here's one where we're using to make sure requirements are in scope. So I'm hoping for those of you who aren't using them, this is getting you um, some ideas around how you might use it. Okay. So um, here's one. Sherry says we're going to utilize BAs more to define the business objectives better. So that's good. So maybe we're not doing it today, but we're going to shift in that direction. So, okay. Thank you, guys. Those are fantastic comments, and I, and I appreciate your participating with me on that one. Um, helps me get a, just a gauge of where everybody is in this. All right. So uh, one of the things that – let's talk about how we use those business objectives. One idea is that we can use them to actually focus the scope of the work that we do. The first thing I would use them for is to determine which projects we should even take on. If the value isn't there, cut the project. Super simple, right? Understand your objectives, assess the value, cut the ones that are of the least amount of value, right? And then within each project, you can use those business objectives again to determine what features are in or out of scope, right? The, and I'm going to show you in a minute um, a little bit more of an idea of how to do that. But the business objectives are that most important like kind of factor or contributor to deciding about your scope. And I saw that in one of your remarks up here. All right, it's not somebody's gut feeling about what we should or shouldn't put in place, our personal desires, or, um, hey, I heard this, like, cool, uh, I, got, I got this cool marketing ad from a company, and they think we need to have this thing. That's not how we decide what to implement or not implement. It's really about what's the actual value delivered. Um, so. Again, like I said, we'll see how we can quantify that value because I think for business analysis purposes um, or product owners, like a lot of times we resort back to this feels like this is more important than this other thing, but this will help us get some concrete measurement behind that and be able to explain it to our stakeholders why something should or shouldn't be ranked higher or not. Right, and both of these up here on the screen you'll notice are cyclic, right? You are constantly reassessing which projects to start or even cancel midway. And you should always be focusing on prioritizing and reprioritizing without the project. It's not a one and done thing almost ever. Um, by the way, this is a really big deal. If you can help recommend projects that should be canceled using real data, um, that's making a big difference in your organization. You can be adding a ton of value if you can make that argument. And it may be scary, and I get that, and everybody will be in a position that they could do it. Um, but if you can, it can be a way that you demonstrate some leadership in your organization. I mean, don't go cancel the ones that are of value, but helping show where something isn't of value and being able to make that recommendation will help um, uplevel your own career, I think. Um, in our organization, because we are working with customer organizations on their projects, um, we, I, I think that we are probably in a safer place to be able to make recommendations about what to cut. Um, it's not like our job's on the line. Whereas an employee in a company I know can struggle a little bit with that idea of like, they're on this project, they don't think the project's important. If they get the project cut, well, what am I gonna work on, right? Uh, and we've done this. I have a, a great example of this a few years back with a company where they had two different projects they were kicking off at the same time and they were related to one another. Um, and we, we looked at it and one of those projects had, uh, let's say an $8 million return on it. 
and it was going to cost them on the order of two million um, over the course of a year to roll this thing out. The other project had a very small return on it, I don't remember, but let's say it was one or two million, and was going to cost like a million to do it, so the ROI on it was really low. And again, they were both related, um, and we were in particular working on that smaller project. And so we went and we looked at this, and we're like, wow, this seems like a really bad idea. Because you're about to spend a year of your resources, your time, your budget, all those things, to deploy this thing that doesn't have anywhere near the amount of value of this other program that you have going on. And our recommendation um, to the executives on that was to cut the project, that smaller project. You should just not do that project, put all your resources into getting the other one right. It's riskier and more important, higher value, right? And so that was our suggestion to them was to go down that path. Um, and that's a real example where we were only going to be working on one of them and we legitimately thought they should cancel the project that they were asking us to help on. They didn't. Um, they decided that to try and do both of them. And I'm going to tell you it was a disaster in the end. Um, the project that I worked on, again, it was fine. It went okay and it, it went more or less as planned. Maybe it took longer than intended, but eventually that got the ROI out of it. The other project where they had estimated this $8 million return and a $2 million, um, or yeah, $2 million cost on it took, uh, oh gosh, probably three or four years and cost them three or four times what they thought it was going to do, which greatly diminished the ROI on it, right? And so it just became kind of a big sore spot. Um, some executives actually lost their jobs over it, which I think is unfortunate, um, not necessarily appropriate that it happened. But nonetheless, it was just really a shame to see that happen, that I think that had they not tried to distract themselves with too many projects, that that probably would have gone better. And I'm willing to bet if most of you look around your organizations, you will see examples of where that's, that type of story has played out, where maybe uh, um, they were overcommitted to too many projects. All right. I promised a way to, to quantify things. So here it is, it's called objective chains. This is, um, this is one of our visual models that we love. Um, and what it does is it ties your features back to your business objectives to assign um, some kind of a benefit to each of the feature. And I'm calling them features. You could talk about these as sets of requirements. You could assign these at the epic level for agile. You could even do it at the story level. I will caution you, and you'll see why in a minute, but I, it's just too much analysis, really. I would not go down to the level of every single story or every single requirement. You will drive yourself insane with the analysis paralysis that would happen. So find some way to roll things together, or just find the things that are um, contentious. We're trying to decide about scope about just a few things, right? So these uh, models are basically links in a hierarchy that tell us how much the requirements contribute to the overall business objective. And this is what helps us figure out what we can cut. And again, you work on like features, um, or you could do this at a project level. You can compare one project to another. So um, the idea behind this is I'm just gonna eliminate requirements based on facts rather than those opinions or those emotions that you might run into. So for example, if you could show that a feature only adds $10,000 to a project that has a $1 million objective, and you have another feature um, that adds a million dollars, okay, to a million dollar project, well, you really only need to build the million dollar feature. But, or like on the screen right now, which ones would I keep? I'd keep the 1 million, I would keep the 500,000, I would maybe keep the 100,000 as my third in line, and then I would cut my $10,000 one. So the idea behind this also, you do not need to be precise in these numbers. You want to get to a rough order of magnitude, though. Let me take you through an actual example from that chemical tracking um, system, purchasing system that I talked about earlier. So imagine I have just a couple high-level requirements. One of those is going to be stockroom inventory recording, and another is chemical container images. The stockroom inventory rec um, recording is used to... Um, basically know what's in the stockroom at any given point in time. So they have chemicals in a lab, they're on the shelves, and they want to have an accurate inventory of what's in that stockroom so that when somebody's requesting that we buy a chemical, they can go just find out if it's in the stockroom before they buy it. So, and, and by the way, this was happening because people were ordering things that were on the shelves, right? The chemical container images feature was really literally putting pictures in the ordering system of those containers so that lab assistants could see what the chemical looks like to make sure that they're requesting the right thing. So it's kind of just a visual cue that I'm buying the right thing or not. 
Now remember, from a couple slides ago, our objective here is to cut our expenses by $250,000. Well, the stockroom recording requirement helps contribute to our business objectives because if the lab assistant knows what's in the stockroom, they can avoid buying chemicals that are already in stock. And so what I'm doing here is I'm making a link on the right all the way back to that blue box on the left, okay? So not buying chemicals that are already in stock saves an average of $200 per chemical. And we know that last year, and this is just having some old data, we bought about 500 chemicals unnecessarily, which gets us to $100,000 benefit. Similarly, the images um, that I talked about where you put the images in the system, all right, those to make sure that users don't make accidental purchases because they can't see it and recognize it, they buy the wrong thing. Um, that still costs $200 per chemical on average when the mistake happens, but what we found was there were only 50 times per year that that mistake would happen. And so that really equated more to a $10,000 value. So looking at these two features alone, one of them contributes to our overall objective significantly and the other one just doesn't. So we would likely want to cut feature number two from scope. And again, these are just two features. I just want to demonstrate the, a simple example list, how you can just relate things to one another to figure out what's important or what not. And this, particular model and this approach to thinking is really important because it's easy to arbitrarily add features that seem in quotes small but in aggregate those small features add up really really fast right they had a lot of cost and risk to include them and if you think about it from the perspective of I've got to have the data there to support it I have to develop it I have to go through testing um, possibly integration checks right I may need to come back if I um, change something else and I've got to do regression testing around one more feature so it adds up really quite quickly and the reality is we don't necessarily need them one of the things I think it's an interesting statistic um, over time is that and this is from the chaos study if any of you have read that or read summaries of it but only about 65 percent of features are really used in software and so this is a great way for us to avoid the things that we don't really need and just never build them in the first place, right? So much um, software bloat out there that's happened and, and we just don't need it. Here's an actual um, example from one of our customers that I'll just go through real quickly that was a call center application that we were working on. This project had three main features. One of those features was to allow a sales rep um, to edit a customer's sharp shopping cart online. So what would happen, it's a complicated sales environment online. Um, I won't go into who the customer was, but imagine it was some, you know, they were configuring computers and equipment around that. And so they would put something in their shopping cart, inevitably pick up the phone to talk to a call center rep because they weren't sure they were doing it right. Um, and so the rep, the idea behind this feature is the rep and the customer could actually see the same cart, right? So one feature is to have the rep pull their cart in and start to modify it themselves and then make the purchase for the customer. Just get a credit card over the phone and make the purchase, okay? There were two other things that they could do. One idea was the rep would pull in the cart, edit the cart, push it back to the customer so the customer could complete the purchase. This was important because sometimes the customer wasn't ready to actually make the buy decision. And then the third one was that the customer could actually see live what the what the, um, the rep was doing on the thing. This project had a $14 million return associated with it. If it could launch by the holiday season, if they missed it, it would be like a zero return in their minds. They just really had to get this out there quickly um, to, to meet a window. And if you look at what I've done here, I've laid out what the dollar value of those different features were. In our $14 million return, 12 million of it simply came where the rep would take in the cart, edit it, and check it out for the customer. And that's like that's the bulk of their return right there. Only about $2 million of the return would come from the case where the customer wanted to buy it on their own later. Um, and the whole like editing live thing had almost no value in the grand scheme of that, $250,000 that we could attribute it to it. So, the way this project worked, I'll just play it out for you, is that um, the business wanted to keep all the features, but they prioritized doing that middle stream first, and then they would come back and get the other ones. And I will tell you that they ended up launching this thing with just that $12 million return and never went back to build the other two features because they got $12 million in return, which was huge, way bigger than the zero that they were on track to get if they tried to do everything on this at the same time. Um, and years later, literally never went back for the rest of it. All right, and I, one thing I wanna say before I leave that model behind is to, 
to figure out those dollar values, you do need to make some assumptions and so try to make smart ones and track what they are in case um, they change over time that you can come back and change your, your equations and your, your numbers in them. Because remember, we're always potentially updating our prioritization. Okay, we know we need to measure whether we've delivered value on our project, so how do we measure that? Um, what do we think we even should be measuring? So one study, and this again is from PMI, has shown us that when executives value requirements, we are more likely to meet our goals, okay? So if our executives can support the time we put into requirements work and doing good business analysis, we're going to be more successful. And we know um, executive love, they love metrics, <laughs> they love to show progress. Um, so that's a good sign that we should focus on requirements metrics to get their attention, right? We can deduce that. Um, so again, this quote just kind of sets up why we why we care about this. We want to get our executives on board. So here are some requirements related metrics that are indicators, good indicators of our tracking towards project success. So will these work? Right? Number of missed requirements, number of requirements models used, number of requirements mapped to models, number of requirements changes after developed. Right, so if you could set, use your defect tracking system to track, hey, that defect was a missed requirement or that one was something that a requirement changed after we already built it. Do these work? Okay, well, you're all mute, so I'm just gonna answer for you. The answer is not really. These are important, but they're not sufficient. And here's the reason why, okay? When we set out to define what the relevant metrics are, I did a lot of research around what are the goals that like CIOs care about um, because I want to get them engaged in caring about requirements. And I'm going to use those to figure out what metrics we should focus on. And here's the thing I'm going to tell you. Nowhere in the research do you see that CIOs care about requirements, right? They don't care about those metrics I just showed you. And that's because, remember, requirements are only a means to an end. So here's the deal. The Society of Information Management, by the way, has a ton of really good, interesting studies they've done. But they do the CIO study every year. And in a recent version, um, what you see up here are kind of the top IT issues that they identified. They have concerns about business and IT alignment. They care about business agility, productivity. They care about cutting cost. They care about time to market, right? That's why you're seeing a ton of agile projects right now. Um, in that same study, these are the top measures of success in IT organizations, okay? Some of those are similar, some are not, and I find it quite interesting, by the way, that the top issues and the top six, six metrics are not actually all related. Like, I kind of feel like if those are the things you care about and you think are high risk, why, why wouldn't you want to measure those? I don't understand that, but nonetheless, that is what the data tells us, right, that there's a disconnect there. So anyway, based on those results, um, kind of some CIO surveys, that we've read, and just even our own experience in dealing with those types of executives, we determined that these are kind of three top um, IT executive goals, right? So IT executives are really trying to align their work to business needs. I am definitely seeing more of that, and I think that's awesome, right? Very exciting that they're not just about delivering two systems into one. They're really about delivering business value. You're seeing that shift happen. With that, they want to shift their budget to things that add value. 80% of the IT budgets are spent on maintenance projects that don't actually increase the value in the organization. Like, that's scary to me. 80% are about maintenance projects, okay? Um, and the other the last one is they're thinking about how do we get products into the hands of the users faster. Again, that is why we see Agile happening. Right, so we're seeing a shift right now. CIOs are really trying to focus on projects that make money rather than save money. I think that's a win. So I'm gonna look at each of those closely and then tie that to metrics that we, in our roles of business analysis, product owners, things that we can measure. Uh, one thing um, that I will share with you real quick is I just heard this story last week from um, somebody I was chatting with at a Fortune 100 company that she said, and that this relates to that, 80% of our budget is not things that add value. She was a business stakeholder who was talking about some new features that they had just launched out to a customer portal. And the business was so excited about these features. They launched them and um, the response times in that portal were so, so bad that they had to roll it all back and spend, no joke, six months refactoring all of the code. The features were all there, but they did six months to refactor the code to fix the performance problem. Um, and, and that happens, right? That's like an underlying architecture problem, clearly. 
um, that they had to address. But that's how we, we quickly get to this number that 80% of what technology teams are working on don't actually add value for the business because it's not, right? Refactoring, if they'd done it right the first time, they would have had um, the value up front. Okay, so let's break these down into metrics that we care about. So increasing business alignment, it's really fundamentally about delivering the actual business objectives. So I wanna make that connection back to what we were talking about earlier. So there's a few metrics we can track. Um, in all these cases, we'd wanna look at kind of a baseline of where we're at and then try to improve it over time. So baseline where you are today, don't worry about what that response is, and then improve from there. So we wanna actually measure how many projects are able to deliver the business benefits or the business objectives. This is super hard to measure, remember? I said that you can't measure them often until way after the project. Um, but nonetheless, we should make a point um, to come back and measure those later so we can start to tally this up. How good are we at this? And then the goal, of course, is to increase those that meet their objectives. Another really good one is to measure user adoption. This is something you can usually do right after you take a system live, right? This is especially important if you're trying to turn off a legacy system. Um, I know that a lot of times organizations just say, hey, I'm going to turn off the old system, so you're going to have to use the new ones, so I'll have 100% user adoption immediately. I'm going to tell you that doesn't always work out as planned. I watched one organization with a, with a call center, actually, where the CIO demanded they're all going to use the new call center when it launches. Well, they had missed some key non-functional requirements around um, how users interacted with the application. Um, the net of it is that users wanted to be able to use the keyboard to navigate the application, not a mouse. Um, and it wasn't designed that way, and literally the sales team refused to use the new application. And so as a CIO who demands we're going to turn off the old application, if your sales team isn't willing to use the new one, you're probably not going to actually turn off the old one. So it's not just as simple as somebody saying it's going to, they're going to have to adopt it, right? Um, and the second column, shifting budgets to deliver value or even better to make money. So um, look at how much of the portfolio value is actually delivered, right? So you have this amount, like number of projects you're gonna to try to deliver. How much are you actually delivering? This could be an indicator that you're trying to do too many things if you're not delivering successfully on them. Another one is look at whether projects and features can actually get cut from scope. Right, so again, 65% of features are rarely never used, so we shouldn't spend money developing them, um, but we can measure which features we develop do actually add value and build those, cut anything that doesn't fit that, and that same thing is true of projects. Cut your lowest value projects and focus on the ones that add the highest value and doing them right. And then under decreasing time to market, right, that's about delivering products to users faster. So let's look at how frequently we release the actual product to users, and over time, you should see that become more frequent. Again, this is all about doing agile and, and you know, maybe sprinting. How do you sprint? How do you sprint? Well, how do you release working product to users? Also, you might want to measure how many IT dollars are spent on rework, which is an indicator we're slowing, um, slowing releases down if we have to rework it before we can actually put it out to users. Now, that all might seem like a tall order if you're not doing any of those things today, and that's fine. Just start with a few, um, and I'll show you in a minute how we did some of this in our own organization. You don't have to go do all those things on day one. Just like pick somewhere to start, right? Here's some other things you could probably measure pretty quickly that are, again, interim measures of the things I just talked about. Number one is business objectives. Do you have them or do you not? Look across your set of projects, and it's either a yes or a no. I have them or I don't. Or you could do, are they measured? Are they measurable? You could even go that far. Um, then when you have them, and they do exist, start to measure them, right? Were they met or not? This is another step toward increasing that business alignment. So just kind of chipping away at this. Another uh, focus on techniques, you know, is we can focus on the techniques that help us cut those unnecessary features and then actually measure it. Today, measure how many features actually get cut in your project, then start to put techniques in place to help you cut scope of the techniques, that, the features that don't add value, and over time, measure how many features am I cutting in a project. Um, and you might even just want to measure, like, how many projects are late or not. That could be a trend towards are we getting things done on time or not and getting better at that. They, those are feel much simpler and much more doable for the um, average organization to start measuring literally today if you wanted to. Okay, let me kind of wrap up a few more things with some results to leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. 
So like I mentioned, we had um, done a little bit of surveying or research on, on our customer projects that we worked with at sea level to measure the value of our requirements work. Um, so first we did a survey to our customers. Um, we didn't have a ton of results. I want to say it was like 43 came in. Um, so there's some interesting data in here, probably not statistically significant. Um, and then from, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, from our larger survey, I will tell you like there's this mix of whether projects even know what the measurable objectives are or aren't, right? Not too surprising. And so that's what you're looking at up here on these charts. It does appear that they usually aren't well known enough that they can use them to prioritize. So I will say that while we see probably more projects have them than don't have them and teams know what they are, that doesn't mean they actually can use them in their project day to day to prioritize. So I, I know a lot of teams are out there and, and, they, and they're talking about business objectives and I love that. The next step is to make those forefront of our mind as we, as we move through the project. And I mean everybody, developers, testers, everyone knows what the objectives are. So everybody's working towards them. Okay, here's some more survey results, right? All right, does the business prioritize using that value? Um, so this is from a business perspective, right? The first grouping tells us in general, the business does think about business objectives just like their projects. So that's great. The middle grouping tells us that they're picking the ones that have the most benefits. So that's good news. They're tending towards selecting the high value projects. And the third one tells us that they know what the projects are as a selected, but they don't necessarily use them to do the prioritization within the project. So kind of aligned with what, um, industry data showing us we saw the same thing with some of our customers um you know we worked we looked at some customers that we're working with every day and and we have some visibility into multiple projects with those customers and so here's just five different sets of data from customers that we work with um some i guess we worked on some we didn't but they're we at least have visibility into those projects um and you can see that most customers um like in most course they have business objectives and some of them are good because they're measurable and others like number five up here, they have hundreds of projects and literally none of them have business objectives. So kind of swing the whole gamut there, right? Um, only a few actually relate their objectives to money um, and almost no one is measuring them after the fact, which is a shame because why are we bothering if we're not gonna go back and see if we delivered the value or not? I think that's fascinating, but if we're going to invest the time to figure out what they are, I feel like we should also invest the time to see if they did what they were supposed to do. Um, okay, one of the things that we started doing on our projects uh, recently was to, to really define clear, uh, concise success, success statements on each of our projects. So what does success look like at the end of this project? And again, that can be related to your business objectives, right? And then we make sure that we use those every day in our project to prioritize the activities that we're working on day to day. So not just prioritizing your requirements, but actually the activities that you're doing. And I tracked these for about a year. Um, and at that point we had almost every single project had a success statement defined for it, which I thought was awesome and amazing like it's not that hard to do we can figure that out most of them are demonstrating that they use those success statements in their daily work to prioritize um, our goal would be to move that 67 percent up as close as we can get it to 100 percent so that again we're not defining it and then putting it on the shelf and never looking at it again Okay, um, in this survey, this is, we're talking about top reasons for project failure. We were asking why our customers thought projects failed. Um, there's a little bit difference from what the executives think, right? You don't have to read all of these. Um, by any means, please don't. If you get the slides later, you can kind of skim through them in more detail. But notice though that the top two reasons are related to the business not knowing what they want. Um, you can see issues, right, with not enough time on requirements, poor BA executions in there. Um, the problems are generally not about developer execution, so that's good, right? Usually it's really more about the business stakeholders and knowing what they want and changing their mind, right? So those top two reasons to me are interesting because it means um, there's a good chance our stakeholders are telling us the wrong requirements. So keep that in mind. If you're doing all the right things to elicit requirements, they may not actually know what they want. Um, and that that's our job to do better elicitation to get that out of them so that we don't have this as a point of failure. Right, and keep in mind, remember, 65% of features are rarely or never used. So our job is to help the stakeholders realize that before we ever get them on paper and build them. A little bit more data here that shows what happens when you focus on cutting the unnecessary scope. An experienced business analyst, I find, can actually cut 80% of features 
because they focus on what's important um, and what gives you the most business value, right? You can really cut anything that doesn't map to highest priority. Our business stakeholders need our help facilitating that discussion though. All right, so this is just like some different examples of scope cutting where we were able to really track it. That last one, like you can cut 95% of a scope, but that was probably a pretty unique. That's probably not the goal you want to actually strive for. Um, I would say anywhere in the 30% range is phenomenal if you can actually cut that much scope. This is kind of a fun example of doing some BA work for value. So this is something else you can measure to show interim success of your BA team. So we are huge fans of using visual models on requirements. I am happy to share more with you on that if you're interested offline. Um, but on this particular project, right, we were really lucky to have this before and after picture. Another software vendor had come in and done requirements. Um, it was basically they bought some software from a company and that company used their analysts to do the requirements. They had produced 27 requirements documents, very, very heavily text-based requirements. They had about uh, just shy of 1,500 requirements written. And our job was to come in and retrofit those requirements with models because our customer was quite confident there were issues and gaps and they didn't know where they were. So we created 345 models beyond what the other company had done. Um, we didn't do a perfect job, we time boxed it. They gave us a window to do it and we did what we could in that window and we still found 180 requirements issues on only 1500 requirements, right? That's huge, right? Those were either things like new requirements or we had to change requirements because they were just wrong. That's like over 10% of the initial requirements had them. And of the models we created, each model um, was generating about two issues per model on average. So that's kind of a fun thing that you could probably measure on some projects. All right, let me kind of finish this up here real quick and hopefully just a couple of minutes for questions. I'm hurrying, Tracy. Um, <laughs> right, so what does a BA do, right? We can't, um, the thing is we can't measure business value until all the projects are over. So just kind of be ready for that, set expectations about it, but see if you can push to come back and measure it later. Um, another thing to know, the data doesn't really always exists, so you're gonna have to make some assumptions. But here's one of my most um, key techniques for you is if you don't have the data to make those assumptions to tie value to features, one of the things you can do is in the next iteration, build the features to capture that data so that you could do it going forward. And then finally, this is a really big one. Um, people don't wanna be held accountable for actual results. So you are going to have to politically maneuver your way through this and not step any landmines if you can avoid it. Um, and, and that is like a BA's skill set. One of your biggest strengths is being able to deal with those different stakeholder challenges and all that. So what do we do? A couple things you can do starting tomorrow is figure out your business objectives. If you don't, I think a lot of you do know them. Try and figure out how do I cut the minimal value features from scope. Start thinking about where we don't need some of the scope. Right? Make a tie between your requirements and your business objectives. Even if you don't do the formal objective chain model that I mentioned, you um, absolutely have some capability there to start thinking about how requirements contribute to business objectives to decide about that scope. And if nothing else, just pick one metric and measure that, okay? All of that with the intent of actually delivering business value. All right, and I'm gonna leave you with one final thought, right? Remember, requirements are just a means to an end, not the end in and of itself. Um, so we can have a ton of huge impact on projects, make a big difference in our organization, simply by focusing our requirements effort to be on those tough decisions about where is the business value. Um, and it doesn't matter if you have perfect requirements, it just matters if the boat floats. With that, I'm gonna hand this back to Tracy, who's gonna read me some of your questions. I'm gonna try and tackle those. And if we don't get to them, please don't hesitate to reach out to me offline. Um, I will put this up here for a minute too. So you have my email address. Thank you. you. Reach me. Yep, thanks Tracy, go Thanks, ahead. Joy. That was an excellent presentation. We do have questions. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna jump right in. Mm -hmm. um, how, do we how do we determine that a project has failed? For instance, is it a feedback or are there objective measures? Great question, I love it. Um, it depends, as is our favorite answer in all things BA. Um, number one is if you have defined business objectives, you determine it failed because you didn't meet the business objectives. Though it is possible that they were bad business objectives or incorrect, I shouldn't say bad, that sounds mean, but <laughs> incorrect ones, like maybe we were trying to measure the wrong thing. So there's 
components of all that, one is figure out did users adopt it or not. Um, I know a lot of project managers would tell you it failed if it was not on time, not on budget. Those are less interesting to me, though not to say they're not important. I think for us it's about we signed up to deliver some kind of value, either we got it or we didn't. Um, we talk around here about like how much should I invest in a particular thing or not, and the answer is do you get five times the value back out of it? Like if I was going to buy software for $10,000, do I get $50,000 of value back? That for me would be success. If I got 11,000, it could still maybe be success, but if I didn't, then it's a failure. So that really depends on the context. Thanks, Joy. Our next question. Uh, this is a question about the, dis dis the value decision tree model. What is the actual name? Ah, the value decision tree model. Okay, that was the objective chain model. I'm gonna pop this book up because I just saw somebody ask for the name of the two books that I referenced on that slide. So I'm gonna put it up here, I think it was George who asked for that, but that book on the left, Visual Models for Software Requirements, this is like my baby, it was my passion to work on this. I love all things models, I could probably do this for two days. One of the models in that book is Objective Chains. You don't have to buy the book, by the way, to learn the model. Um, I have, and somebody can reach out to me if they want to, but there's like this business of Objective Chain white paper that um, has, the content in it, but also it's just a page on our um, blog or our content. So I can point someone to it if you're interested in knowing more about that model. It's called the objective chain though. Thanks, Joy. Our next question, can you mention some of the requirement models that you alluded to earlier? Yeah, so there's some really basic ones that you may not call models in your mind, but process flows are a really easy one for everybody, including the business to understand. They don't have to be trained. Um, I'm going to say this though, don't put everything in one model. <laughs> so don't make a process flow that has 100 steps in it. Figure out how to chunk that up. Some other ones, we have one called a business objectives model. I didn't go into it here, but I talked about the elements of it a little bit here. Uh, we do that on every single project. I can't remember the last time I didn't do one of those. Process flows are super common. We have one called ecosystem map, which is showing all the different systems and scope and how they interact with one another. We have one called a business data diagram. If you're familiar with an entity relationship diagram, it looks like that. It's really focused on business objects and how they relate to one another. Lots of good techniques with that to identify everything from business rules to even just like stories um, off the data. And um, I feel like I could talk about that for a while, Tracy, but I'm going to pause because <laughs> I've just named a few. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. How would you move it back to your contact slide? And I'll ask, uh, we'll have time for one more question, a uh, common question. I found that a lot of projects I've worked on don't provide clear business objectives to the analysis team. My guess mm -hmm. is that they don't flow down from the executive team's decision-making right. process for which projects get undertaken. How often mm -hmm. do you experience the same issue? I would say almost always, the only time I don't experience that issue is when I'm working with the executives directly. Um, and so the answer to the, how do you, well, she didn't ask the question or he didn't ask the question. The answer though, if you were wondering how do I do that, is you really need to find that connection back to the executive team. It doesn't have to be you, it could be through some other people. One of the things that I have done is if we're working with stakeholders who just don't have that information, maybe they work for the people who have it or three levels below, is help and they're not comfortable with us talking to them, let's say, is help phrase some questions like, it's almost like you wanna give them very simple elicitation questions to take back and have the conversation without you to get what you need. Um, there are some, you know, just ways you can say, which is like, you know, it could be, why are we doing this project? What would happen if we didn't do this project, right? What is the, um, measure, how would you measure if it was successful or not? It's some really simple questions. They're hard to answer, but they're simple to ask that anybody could ask them and kind of start to facilitate getting those out of the people who, who legitimately care. So very common and something you can overcome with some work and practice on that. Thank you, Joy. We are just about out of time. Uh, did you have any final words before the end of our session today? I'm going to remind you all of a quote that I've used a few times in this talk today is that requirements are only but a means to the end. Let's focus on the business value to figure out if we're doing a good job. 
Thank you, Joy. Um, that was such a great session today. It's a real pleasure to watch. We'd also like to thank everyone for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. And I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar, along with uh, the slides and the recording, will be archived at the modernanalyst.com website within a few business days. Thanks so much, everyone. This concludes today's event. And have a great day.